Hello, everybody. I'd like to thank you all for coming this evening and uh, for coming to listen to this conversation with these uh, brilliant two peoples who are beside me. Let me begin by paying respects to all those people of the Gadigal Nations and its elders. And I want to pay my respects to those folks who, as you pointed out, who are struggling to protect their lands and their rights, and to those who reclaim their languages, which we'll be talking about this evening, and to revitalize their traditional practices, and to those who maintain the old songs and create new ones, which we'll talk about tonight. Finally, I pay my respects to all those artists who use voice of our time. So thank you very much. And welcome, everybody. Yeah, it's nice. I am here for 10 months, so uh, if you need to uh, talk to me, call me, complain to me, whatever. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, the invitation this evening uh, to participate in uh, this conversation. Uh, I'm very excited, very pleased, very honored to be your in interlocutor to this evening. And um, I'm very excited about this format before we actually get on to the formal paper by Mikkel. Um, and Tammy, who is a uh, Sydney-based col uh, collaborator and who is on the staff here at Powerhouse, which we just heard. I just met her on Zoom the other day. So Mikkel is from the Simxian uh, community, and she will pronounce uh, what the, they call themselves in her formal paper. Uh, Tammy is from the Murawari peoples of? Uh, Murawari and Wiradjuri nations in Northwest New South Wales. Okay, welcome. I'm in Lily's country. <laughs> welcome. Um, I first met uh, Mikhail about 20 years ago, if you can believe it. I was young. I don't know about you, I guess. <laughs> she was quite young, yeah. Uh, she came to Washington, D.C. Uh, for a summer program. I was working, we were both there at the National Museum of the American Indian, uh, which uh, opened the following year in 2004. And uh, so she came, and it was really a delight to meet her at that time. And, and since then, I've followed her career. She doesn't know that, but I have. And uh, which I think some of us do, the older folks, right? We follow the career of young people to make sure that they're following that path, and she has certainly been following that. And uh, we try to encourage, of course, our younger generations to, to follow the ways, the old ways, their people's ways, or even the academic ways <laughs> of those that have gone before. So, and Tammy, as I said, I just met uh, a few days ago over the Zoom, so, um, and you've invited me to come here to look, yeah. peek in your collection, which I'm really looking forward to. You have some uh, indigenous American material here, which I, uh, I remember being here many, many years ago and seeing Northwest Coast. I don't know, Mikhail, if you've seen some of the Northwest Coast Haida material, which was quite exciting to me at the time that I saw. Uh, so um, let's get on with this. So question number one. And uh, by the way, I love this format. Um, and I think Mikhail does as well of uh, just me asking them questions before we get to the, the meat of the matter, and that's Mikhail later tonight. So, so Mikhail, what, uh, what inspired you to follow the path that you're on? I first, uh, to follow my people's protocol. And I said that my real name is Simtlodam Newsom. I am of the Eagle Clan of Matlakatla, Alaska, and I shared my utmost gratitude to our Gadigal Walaisk, our Gadigal relatives, for being caretakers of this unceded land since time immemorial, and that we have the privilege and honor of being guests here. So um, what brought me to this path um, academically and artistically is being raised in my community of Matlakatla, Alaska. I was raised on country, as said here. And if I start using a lot of terminology that is very uh, familiar, very uh, Australian, is because I've been here for three weeks now. 
Um, <laughs> and I love Sydney. I fell in love with Gadigal country as well as Bidigal country, um, specifically the ocean and Bidigal country. Um, I'm an island person. Um, Malakatla, Alaska is uh, the only Indian reserve in Alaska. So we did not cede our land rights. Uh, we own eight, uh, 86,000 acres of land and um, of our island and 3,000 feet of water around the circumference of our island. So I grew up knowing truly what sovereignty is. We have our own laws, our tribal council. Uh, my mom, 27 years on our tribal council, and I feel that my academic and, and cultural and community path has always been in the same way that my mom has uh, led her life and continues to lead her life, um, which is to do all I can to make sure that my uh, education and training work experience is of um, serves and is of benefit to our people. Thank you. Tammy, we're not going to talk about museums tonight. Dance. Who inspired you or what inspired you to do what you're doing? Like, I know you guys are this week talking to you and listening to you. Yeah. Dance was the, the big thing. Yes. Well, if we were talking about dance, unlike my Kiel, I didn't grow up um, learning my traditional dances. Um, and so if I'm talking plainly about how I came to dance, it was very much through the Western styles of dance, jazz, tap, ballet, Cabaret. My first professional work was um, with a very famous, um, they were once an adagio act um, at the Moulin Rouge and, and right across Europe, Dance Encore, who actually um, set off some brilliant careers um, from a lot of dancers in this country. So my first foray into dance was very much Western style dancing. It wasn't until I went to university and had an Indigenous teacher at university who spotted me out straight away and she kind of pulled me off to the side and sort of said, are you Aboriginal? And I went, yes, I am. I, I was so pumped that she could actually see it in the way that I moved. She said, oh, yeah, I can tell by the way you walk. And I said, oh, okay, cool. And so I came to traditional dance kind of through, through the back door, um, yes, and had a great commercial, um, touring commercial career and then I went to university and then I had to go back home to country and actually go back to family who, and those that knew, had little bits and bobs of information that could share. And then through my time at uh, NASDA College, which is the National Aboriginal and Islander Skills Development Association, um, where Bangara, um, one of our flagship companies, has grown out of, I was there for four and a half years and I was really um, so privileged to be able to learn a lot more of cultural practice there. Through, through the NASDA college. Um, <laughs> you said uh, <laughs> she noticed the way you walked. I thought, that's interesting. Somebody once said to me that indigenous people have a certain way of walking versus Europeans. Yeah. And uh, so he showed me what it was. I'll show you later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tanya Lucan Linkleiter, who you might know. Uh, also from Alaska, uh, now living in Canada, is an artist and a theoretician. Some of you may or may not know her. Her dance, uh, her practices in, uh, encompass dance, performance, video, etc. And, and she produces uh, performances with dancers, composers, musicians, etc. But none of her dances involve, as far as I know, traditional dances. Instead, she draws inspiration from other artists, indigenous artists. She says. Uh, okay, I'm just giving you some kind of historical uh, material so that Mikhail and, and, and Tammy can respond to, uh, because it's all about dance. Uh, in 2000, uh, that's 22, 23 years ago, a Mohawk Canadian curator by the name of Leon Martin, who I had the pleasure of working with many, many years ago, uh, curated an exhibition with another, uh, with another person that I uh, knew quite well, the late Bob Boyer. And the exhibition was called Powwow, an Art History. And uh, it was a touring show uh, which featured uh, Canadian and uh, US uh, artists. And Bob Boyer himself was a traditional powwow dancer. And uh, I was a traditional powwow dancer many years ago before I think some of you were born. Uh, Bob and I uh, danced together. We toured powwow circles and uh, which is a lot of fun. But we also did uh, 
shows. We did performances publicly uh, for local farmers or what have you, local towns. We also went one time to Disneyland in Los Angeles to perform there. That was kind of interesting. <laughs> so I have that background, right? Uh, Mikiel, uh, with your work in dance and song, I know that your presentation tonight will address notions of dance sovereignty. Could you give us a sneak peek about what you're going to be talking tonight and why dance and song are critical to a new indigenous art history? I'd rather save that for my paper <laughs> and uh, take this moment to, uh, to acknowledge the work of Tanya Lukin Linklater, who you started with, because uh, uh, Tammy uh, Gazelle and I just published a piece um, that included uh, Tammy, that specifically about indigenous dance in, in art galleries. And uh, because I'm really bad with acronyms, I can see the acronym, but I can't think of the name of the journal. Do you want to share the name of the journal? Yes, it's the Australian New Zealand Arts Journal. And this, this uh, journal was specifically dedicated to um, indigenous uh, cultures along the Pacific. And it's edited by uh, Heather Gloriorte. So where um, Gerald suggests that uh, Tanya Lunkin Linkletter's performances don't include indigenous dance practices specific to her people, they actually draw upon uh, the colonial archive that has um, confiscated and taken the ancestral belongings of her people. So her dance practices actually draw up upon, she started by working in museums, and so she's gone into collections and brought pieces from collections into her pieces, um, into her performances. Uh, Tammy, do you share a similar or alternative view about, uh, about kind of the critical indigenous art history and dance? I do. I have a very strong view about it, and it's growing as I learn more. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fast realising over the last three years that I've been working in the museum how potently vital dancers or cultural people with dance knowledge how much they are how we need them in these spaces to make sense of the cultural belongings that we hold for too long we've collected objects 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 where i find the power comes from being a dancer is that our job as a dancer is to transform from being an object to becoming a subject and as kind of first year university that may sound it's so profoundly on the money for what we are doing so often when, particularly in my own experience here coming at the museum at a time where we were so privileged to conduct an audit of the entire museum's collections to really seek out materials which were not only relevant to us but those that were really culturally significant. Um, and so having the opportunity to do that and then spend time with these cultural objects and materials in a way that a dancer would to sit with it, to listen to it, and to find where the weight lies with it. Um, I've, I am so deeply indebted to um, Markiel and people like uh, Tanya, and there's a raft more now that I'm discovering as I'm starting to realise that, oh, this is actually a thing. I thought it was just dancy tam dancing Tammy at the powerhouse, <laughs> thinking that she knew quite a bit because she could recognise that gesture or that posture or that design or that piece of regalia that I, it instantly spoke to me because I'd either danced it or known someone who's danced it or recognised the ceremony that it came from or a particular weave or a certain feather or a particular scar. The eyes that being a dancer gives you is, I think, is fundamental to really understanding cultural materials that have been acquired or collected or obtained in sometimes nefarious ways um, because it's not just the object, it's the story that goes along with it and I think so often dancers are trained in the way to be able to see that um, and speak to it because as dancers we can't speak 
It's not the song man. Someone else has got that part of it. We can only show you. And our objects and materials in the museum are in the same position. So I think, ah, that's what I've been taught how to do this for. It's to give these things a voice. Give, give these, not things, but these objects and materials their name back or their purpose. So as I'm learning more about the solid groundwork that has been put in place by yourself um, and, and others in the same elk, to, to where it is seriously already informing Indigenous dance practice in Australia because we've all been jumping onto your beautiful scholarship, but also I think in terms of collecting practices and how that's informing institutions about best care. How do, if we are going to keep these materials in this place, how are we going to look after them properly? Because we are in the business of telling the truth. That's all we're here to do as a museum. We're truth tellers. And if you can't tell the truth, then you should probably keep it out the back off the shelf until you find out what it is, where it came from, what it's for, and whether it should be out there at all. So that's kind of been my introduction to it. So I think it's really important. Mm. I like your um, <coughs> drawing the distinction between object and subject, yeah. because I think for Indigenous folks that's so critical. And, um, and for so long, museums have, uh, and we're still museums are like that. And uh, what I found, I was at the Art Gallery of New South Wales yesterday, and what I noticed was uh, they took the, uh, the metaphoric glass boxes off the objects. And I, I use that in, in, in an ironic way. I don't yeah. say mean objects, but I mean the works itself because uh, and what I know that you're going to talk about is is how do we how do we animate uh, uh, some of the older stuff, right? Uh, because they lie there, as you say, as objects. And and indigenous folks, the idea is to transform them into subjects, yes. into first person, in order to speak to them, right? Because they speak to you. You 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 engage in the language that you share, right? And I think that th that was the first step to me of taking the glass vitrines off and presenting them like that. And I thought that that's critical. And the other thing I think museums have to do, and as you were saying, uh, have to bring in sound, bring in movement, because all our stuff, and Mikhail will be talking about that tonight, I'm sure, is uh, stuff moves. Yeah. Things move. They, 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 they're, that's the magic, right? That's, that's, that's where it's at, and that's where it sounds. Yes, go ahead. It's really interesting because uh, I feel like uh, the stereotypes that I deal with around specifically dance practices that people consider, I use traditionally contemporary because our people have an ancient practice of using the tools and technologies of the, the time period in which we live in to express who we are as indigenous people today. And that's what our ancestors did with every everything that was traded into the territories, that's what we do. and. Uh, so some of what you're w referring to is actually more uh, in regards to what I'm going to say today mm -hmm. is more about my artistic practice where this talk is within the context of the Power Institute, which is one of the funders of the art history department. So there's uh, a tension at play that you'll see within my work that is uh, this argument that I've been in for you know, over a decade now of where indigenous dance practices, uh, how they should be in indigenous art history. Mm -hmm. So where you two are talking about subject and object, I'm, I'm, I've seen dance marginalized as the context of study rather than the subject. Yeah. People just become blinded by the idea that, oh, dancing is what indigenous people do. And what is that thing that they're dancing with? This is what art history does, is they take the thing and make that the subject of study. So I've taken that and flipped it on its head and approached it in an entirely different manner within my academic work. My other side of my work as an art historian is doing what we did on Monday which is a critical intervention within colonial archives. So my husband and I, Mike D'Angeli, who's an artist in Carver, who you'll learn about a little in my presentation, we uh, make it a priority to visit museum archives everywhere that we go, and we spend time with ceremonial belongings, and we sing to them. 
We speak our language to them. We speak the language, their language, if we know their language as well, because we you know, pick up each other's words and each other's languages over time because they're just as lonesome for us as we are for them. And the time that I spent in the powerhouse's uh, archive, it was incredible because, uh, as I said, I'd been here for three weeks. This is the end of my third week. I'm going home tomorrow, which I'm really excited about. Um, so the first two weeks I was here, I was invited as an international um, guest artist for with uh, Marageku, which is one of Canada or one of Canada, one of Australia's. <laughs> Uh, longest standing uh, contemporary and, and most renowned contemporary indigenous dance companies. And we spent two weeks, and uh, here my sister G, giggling G, um, in the background, because she was, we essentially lived together, <laughs> it felt like, in carriage works for two weeks, where we shared our processes, our practices, our, um, and then excerpts of things that we were working through. Being a guest artist, I wasn't sharing excerpts, I was sharing methodologies, ways of thinking through performance creation. And for um, us, um, where activating ceremonial belongings in collection is not necessarily about having that um, physically, those ceremonial belongings. A lot of the practice uh, that Get High X, my dance group, performs is about calling upon them within to our performance because they're a vessel. That's what museums own, but they don't own its noch noch. They don't own the power within that vessel. So when we um, spent time in the collections of the powerhouse, when we spent time in the collections of the powerhouse, um, it was like, coming out of seclusion because I'd been in this dance lab for two weeks. This is my eighth presentation since I've been in <laughs> been here. Um, the dance lab ended in a symposium where I gave a keynote on a, another aspect of my work. And um, so to go from being immersed in, in, in dance to going into the stillness of an archive was like jumping into cold water. But then all of these dance histories came dancing right out. Um, there's a Kukwakiwa totem pole that is in the archive, that uh, a full-size monumental totem pole uh, by Richard Hunt that was gifted to the Australian Museum um, during the 1988 Expo. And the reason he gave it to the museum is because when he came here with his dance group for the expo, he saw masks from his community and he learned of this history of where um, under the potlatch ban, as I'll, ta I'll talk about in my paper, from uh, 1884 to 1951, our songs, dances, and ceremonies were criminalized in Canada. During that same time, there was a huge demand, especially in Europe, for indigenous performances. So Indian agents could get authorization from the government for our peoples on the coast to go dance anywhere outside of Canada for exhibitions and human zoos and world fairs. Well, this group of Kukwakiwa, just after the turn of century, century in the Kukwakiwa, I'm actually talking about them in my paper, their traditional territory is Vancouver Island, just outside of uh, the ma lower mainland of Vancouver. They were abandoned here. So their, their, um, the production that they were a part of didn't make as much money as this ringmaster um, thought it was going to, and he just left them. And so what they did is that they sold their masks, they sold their regalia, they sold all their ceremonial belongings to a collector who then donated it to the museum. And when Richard was here at, for the 88 Expo, he saw them and learned of this history and he essentially said, I'll carve you a totem pole if you let me bring them home. So this is an early 
example of repatriation that happens prior to the establishment of the Native American Graves Protection Repatri Act, Repatriation Act in the US, which is 1990, not that it applies in, to international context, it doesn't, but it set a precedence for museums around the world to think more critically about their collections in relationship to the living people. So that dance history came right at us, and then uh, I was just over the moon, and I have to write this up, and I have to figure out who the relatives are, and I, so I have a lot of work to do in the archives there. And then uh, the first um, ancestral belonging in the collection was a pair of moccasins from Sanemo territory, and being dancers in, in the collection, I just flipped them over, and you can see the full in, instep of the dancer's feet, and having uh, been in the big house um, for their ceremonies, so their long house, I could see, and I was showing Tammy, I just got up and said, this is how they move their feet, and I can see where, why this imprint is heavy at the front because of the way that they slide their feet, their toes are gonna be very heavy towards the front of their moccasin. Um, so dance histories are in the archive, and, and I feel that it's, you know, those of us that dance are the ones that we have a responsibility to these ancestral belongings and the ancestors to bring those to life. So you did give us a sneak peek. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now for, I'm just gonna end here, for 40 years of my career, uh, in talking and writing about indigenous art, it's been about sovereignty, to establish voice, voice of authority for indigenous art and artists practice uh, in Canada, US, and around the world. Uh, in my waning years, uh, I have shifted from sovereignty, the idea of sovereignty to knowledge. And while some in our community uh, are talking now of visual sovereignty, and I think you're gonna be talking a bit about that. I have shifted my focus to what in my Plains Cree language is which basically means, or roughly means, visual knowledge. Um, and on a broader scale, it may mean indigenous ways of seeing. So tonight, uh, Mikhail will be articulating dance sovereignty which she says is an embodiment of politics and self-determination in our community and others along the west coast of Canada and the United States. So I wanted to thank both these ladies for joining me tonight and giving an introduction to Mikhail and a warm welcome. Uh, would you please give a warm welcome for Mikhail, who will be our guest speaker tonight. Just a, a bit of clarification. I actually don't say dance sovereignty, I say dancing sovereignty. And the reason that I have it in the verb form rather than the noun form, other than I teach my language and I am a language geek, I teach, I taught in our fluency program at the University of Northern British Columbia. I do uh, K through 12 teaching and curriculum development is to honor the verb centered um, nature of our languages as indigenous people. So my talk today is Dancing Sovereignty, um, Protocol and Politics in Indigenous Dance Practices. Just uh, here's a bit of a roadmap of my presentation, or hopefully a roadmap, hopefully I stay on this. Um, so first, this is where I'm taking you, and I hope that um, this allows for us to have a generative conversation uh, during the Q&A. But before I begin, I'm going to start with some terminology to build a common understanding. Um, and then how I came to include dance in my work as an art historian. I'll then move on to my research methodologies and the ways in which it formed the concept of dancing sovereignty. And finally, I am going to end with a case study that's going to weave this all together. 
through a detailed analysis of land-based practices of creating new songs and dances. I'm going to use the term Northwest Coast First Nations a lot. So this is the Northwest Coast, and unfortunately, most maps either cut off part of Alaska or cut off Western Washington, so I always have to put two maps together. Um, that Northwest Coast First Nations refers to the indigenous peoples whose territories are shown here, are known by their colonial names as Western Washington, the coast of British Columbia, and Southeast the Southeast Alaskan Panhandle, as far north as Yakutat, and as far inland as Whitehorse and the Yukon. So that's really far uh, inland. And uh, coast is still applied to them, so you know how these terms work. They're not really that functional. Um, and the Northwest Coast is one of the most diverse regions of indigenous people on Turtle Island with approximately 59 languages spoke by 70 First Nations, and that doesn't include all of the dialects within those languages. My research focuses on the work of indigenous dance groups from this region who lead, uh, who lead dance groups, so the work of indigenous dance artists from this region who lead dance groups, as well as compose and choreograph new songs and dances. The term dance group, not dance troupe or company, you will get corrected pretty quick, is commonly used by our people to refer to self-determined collectives of singers, drummers, and dancers who perform songs and dances owned by their nations, clans, families, communities, and um, both songs that are owned collectively and individually. Some of the dance groups that I've worked closely with throughout my research um, include the Gatwina dancers who are shown here, of the Kukwakiwa Nation, the same nation who, who had an ensemble of dancers who were abandoned here um, just after the turn of the century, who I referred to. The Gatwina are based out of Alert Bay um, on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. The Dakaquan dancers, uh, Clinkett Tangish nations based in Whitehorse, Yukon. The Leilala dancers of the Kukwakiwa Nation based on Vancouver Island and the Lower Mainland. Statu Takaya of the Musqueam and Stalo Nations based in Musqueam, which is just past uh, the University of British Columbia. Well, it's the University of British Columbia occupies their territory and their reserve is just past that. The dancers of Dem Lahamid, uh, Gitsan and Cree, of uh, the Gitsan and Cree nations based in the lower mainland of Vancouver, and many others. As I mentioned in that sneak peek, as Gerald refers to it, of uh, my paper today, that Northwest Coast First Nations dance practices cannot be separated from their criminalization in Canada through the amendment to the Indian Act that outlawed potlatching and associated songs and dances from 1884 until 1951. Everything involved in our dance practices, including our processes of dramaturgy, cannot be separated from their criminalization in Canada. And potlatch, if you're unfamiliar with that term, is a central and most important ceremony held in common amongst the many nations on the Northwest Coast. Literally, it was illegal for us to be who we are and forced by jail time and confiscation of our ceremonial belongings until 1951. To truly understand and appreciate the complexities of our reclamation and resurgence, we have to engage with our cultural oppression and how it informs our practices today. As early as the 1940s, the formation of and performances by dance groups in British Columbia critically engaged with the Indian Act criminalizing our songs, dances, and ceremonies. Artist and political activist George Cludesy, shown here, Nuchanuth Nation, 
led a dance group in the 1940s to encourage First Nations youth to be proud of their heritage and to promote the accomplishments of First Nations people in ways that would garner the attention and respect of non-Indigenous peoples. Art historian Ron Ronald W. Hawker observed that Cludice's dance group's performances broke the terms of the Indian Act, which prohibited First Nations people from dancing in locations off their own reserve. The section of the Indian Act that Hawker refers to spe uh, specify that First Nations people had to obtain permission from an Indian agent, just like the permission I talked about that allowed for dancers to come here to participate in any, quote, show, exhibition, performance, stampede, or pageant outside his or her reserve or be liable to fines and imprisonment. Political activist and actor Chief Dan George of the Tsleil-Waututh Nation was also in breach of the potlatch ban when he began a dance group in the 1940s. Chief Leonard George, Dan George's son, grew up as a dancer. When I interviewed him about the early performances of his dance group when it was illegal for them to perform, he shared with me that, he, and this is his words, quote, to make our performances legal, we performed bluegrass music as well as Slewata songs and dances. So on the in-between, the subversive ways in which these early dance groups performed these, their ancient songs and dances, as well as new ones that they were creating, that balance of bringing other art forms into their performances allowed for them to pass. But it also allowed them to pass on pride and to in, instill and inspire generations that were watching them. For example, the children of Takaya, the dance group that uh, Chief Dan George started and Leonard George led and now is led by his son, Gabriel George, inspired the creation of Spaku Slalom. So this is Sa'aplak, Bob Baker. He's the leader of the Squamish dance group, Spaku Slalom. He said he remembers watching Chief Dan George's group perform when he was a student in residential school. That's how they were intervening into these places that were created to exterminate our ways of knowing and being. Sa'aplak, Bob Baker said that it was seeing this dance group, seeing uh, statue, or seeing children of Takaya perform that um, instilled in him the desire to start his own dance group one day. And his dance group is uh, one of the most well-known groups in the Vancouver area. Children of Takaya, Chief Dan George's dance group still performs today. Their members are primarily composed of Chief Dan George and Leonard George's children and grandchildren. In the history that I've been uh, working to trace in terms of um, when dance groups started, they're the earliest dance groups with this Children of Takaya, um, as well as George Cludice's dance group. The formation of dance groups became more common and widespread on the Northwest Coast um, since the 1960s. The increased number of dance groups in Canada may, have, may uh, have to do with the lifting of the potlatch ban in 1951. The widespread formation of dance groups in both rural and urban areas along the Northwest Coast since the 1960s has been a powerful social movement of what uh, Anishinaabek scholar and activist Leanne Simpson describes as a nat nation culture-based resurgence. She states that through nation culture-based resurgences, we are re reinvesting in our own ways of being, regenerating our political and intellectual traditions, 
articulating and living our legal systems, learning our ceremonial and spiritual pursuits, creating and using artistic and perf performance-based traditions. The dramatic increase in dance groups is evidence in the, evident in the number of participation in this event, the celebration. And if you can find me, I'll buy you a coffee because I'm in there. It's like, where's Waldo? Indigenous where's Waldo here? So this is the largest gathering of dance groups on the Northwest Coast. It's funded by Sea Alaska Heritage Foundation. When it first started in 1982, there were 150 dancers. And um, in, at the last celebration, there were over 2,000. In Vancouver, so the Northwest Coast has both unfortunately been colonized by Canada and the US, so I try to keep that representation balanced. So that's on the, on the Alaska side. On the BC side, um, this event, Hobie just last year, which uh, Tammy was able to come and see my dance group performance there, um, was just, just over 2,000 dancers, so nearly 3,000 dancers. Regardless of the um, huge amount of dance groups, my small community of Matlakatla, Alaska, there are 1,200 people, and we have five dance groups. And it's like that in just about every community on the coast. Um, that the prevalence of dance, group, dance groups and their performances in, in cities and rural communities, there's very little scholarship on them. My work as an art historian is primarily it. There might be one or two references and others, but for it to be the entire focus of the work is an injustice. It's a disservice to the work of these incredibly talented interdisciplinary artists who work in dance, dramaturgy, uh, composition, they're writing their songs, they're creating their dances, as well as they're, doing, they're creating their regalia, um, so both visual and performing arts. That my dissertation, which is now my book project, um, is a part, as I was saying earlier, is with my responsibility to, to serve my community and people and do all I can to stop the continuation of this colonial erasure. So I'm going to play just a little excerpt for you of a performance, because I feel that Northwest Coast First Nations dance is overlooked in many fields of studies, including art history, which I critique a lot because I have my bachelor's, my master's, and my PhD in art history. I just kept at it and changed those guys someday. And I think I have, which I'll get to later, uh, that I feel like part of it is an inability to see and perceive its complexities as an artistic practice. So I'll give you an example. This Grease Trail song was composed by composer and choreographer William Wasden, Wahoidi, Chief Wahoidi, in 1991. Not to generalize the many perceptions and visual literacies and dance literacies that exist in the room, because I know it's really diverse, but I will in this moment. For many people, 
Seeing indigenous dancers dancing in ceremony or regalia can produce a form of what is referred to by performance scholar Diana Taylor as precepticide. Diana Taylor uses the term precepticide to describe a form of social blinding produced by being inundated with images of events, activities, or particular variations of histories that work that, that works to use people's own vision against them. She describes it as a, quote, a form of killing or numbing the senses, unquote. The easy, easy equivalent made between Indians and dancing is deeply ingrained in public consciousness through cinema as far back as Edison's first silent film and has steadily been perpetuated through representations in movies, TV, and media. When it comes to forms of indigenous dance that are considered traditional, Percepticide can also produce a denial of coexistence where viewers, even though they see, and in some cases they share spaces to say, those dancers are alive, right in front of me. But it's a denial of coexistence that puts people subconsciously and their practices in the past rather than the present. How do I know this? As was shared a little bit, um, I'm the le co-leader of the Get High X dancers. I lead the Get High X with my husband, who's dancing behind me there, and our middle son, Nick D'Angeli, who is here as an emerging artist in Marageku's Indigenous Dance Lab, our, our beautiful dancers up there. And we are training our son, Nick. This is Nick dancing his uh, transformation mask, and he and I dancing together are Thunderbird, and most recently, uh, my, my husband had a surprise baby <laughs> that we were very, very happy about. Um, our three-year-old is an incredible dancer and singer, constantly um, a constant source of inspiration for us and creating new songs um, all of the time. So in our practice, we are uh, constantly confronted with this idea of tradition being this static, oversimplified um, place in which our artistic practices somehow exist um, instead of being vibrant artistic practices that continuously produce new songs, dances, and collaborations of all sorts. We've collaborated with the Go Ballet. We've collaborated with the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. There, And this is just in, in my study of indigenous dance practices along the Northwest Coast. Sa'aplak, Bob Baker, whose dance group I um, spoke of where he was inspired by um, Chief Dan, Je Dan George's dance group to start his own group. He's collaborated with aerial dancers. These, uh, these practices engage with uh, both art practices of all sorts, but also politically in ways that reify and affirm indigenous land rights, water, rights to waterways, and um, place in through as uh, protocol indigenous laws as the framework for collaborations. But back to the stereotypes and the way that they function. So the stereotypes that dominate both popular and academic discourse around dance along the Northwest Coast uh, discredits the work of Northwest Coast First Nations dance artists, dance group leaders, composers, and choreographers who are actively producing performances of both ancient songs and newly created ones, as well as dances that are critically engaged with pressing political issues today. This ongoing marginalization, it causes far more than just gaps in the literature. 
It has the potential to undermine rights-based claims to land, resources, and other aspects of indigenous sovereignty vital to the lifeways, priorities, and futures of Northwest Coast First Nations people. My personal engagement and awareness of these issues and how systemic they are of many other colonial practices of erasure led to my research on this topic. First, uh, through the work of these three incredible dance artists, Apla, Bob Baker, Gilda Dawit, Margaret Grenier, uh, Gitsan, director, Gitsan and Cree director of the Dancers of Dem Lahamid, and Kukwakiwa dance artist William Wazden, Chief Wahuidi, whose uh, work will be the, the case study that I focus on today. In our work on indigenous art histories, and again, that'll be my focus of this talk because of uh, the relationship to the, the Power Institute here at the University of Sydney, uh, which houses the art history department. A major value of the theories and the methodologies that we utilize, critique, create, and are built upon is its potential to give others the ability to view and understand works and artistic practices more deeply in ways that are critically engaged with a wide range of cultural, political, and social issues. My research on Northwest Coast First Nations dance, I've been I've endeavored to develop both a new indigenous research methodology as well as a theory that allows for more complex understandings of the artistic processes behind specific dance group performances and the way in which they carry forward dancing sovereignty. So being a dancer, my part of my research methodology, and you can see me taking picture of dance dancers of Den Muhammad right there, was carrying my camera in my rattle bag <laughs> and dancing my camera and uh, also writing, doing the final edits of my dissertation. Uh, <laughs> during Hobie of uh, 2014, when you have to get it done, you have to get it done. I'm gonna carry it all at the same time. Um, that my research methodology is um, through, it's a potlatch-based indigenous research methodology that I refer to as witnessing. And for those that are, would like to know a little bit more about potlatching, to put it very succinctly, amongst Northwest Coast First Nations people, potlatches are complex systems of indigenous governance where hereditary rights, kinships, and their associated histories are asserted through oratory, songs, dances, regalia, totem pole raisings, and many other ceremonies which validate such claims through feasting and the distribution of gifts to witnesses. My practice of witnessing as an indigenous research methodology is based on my upbringing, training, and responsibility as witness to potlatches, feasts, and other First Nations ceremonies that occur in our territories. Developing and utilizing this methodology in our field of art history is another way in which I'm actively decolonizing my work as a scholar, as well as my way of decolonizing art history and its approaches to our people. Key to my witnessing methodology is attentive listening and observing with the objective of remembering in great detail and responding in ways that recall the most important aspects of what occur. This is essential to our responsibility when you're a witness to a potlatch. Methods of this, my method of witnessing puts earning and maintaining permission first. Regardless of my lifelong connection to indigenous dance groups along the Northwest Coast, it's taken me a great deal of time, as it would anybody, to establish the trust necessary for a more in-depth inquiry into their practices. Foundational to this trust is informed and ongoing consent. My research and writing is done with careful consideration that through building relationships, I've been entrusted with cultural knowledge, some of which I have no right to share. And that drove my department crazy. 
Still didn't share it. Out of respect and protection of this privileged knowledge and adherence to protocol, I made it clear during the time I spent with dance artists and their dance groups and families before I started my research that they have the right to, with, to request that I withhold any of the information that they share. In Indigenous ways of knowing and being, this strengthened my methodology, but more so my relationship to all of these dance artists and communities. During a potlatch, taking on the responsibility of witness is reciprocated with gifts. You receive gifts, and in those payments, you are taking on the responsibility to remember. But my witnessing methodology inverts that in a way that I'm reciprocating all this time and energy and knowledge that is shared with me by gifting everyone that was a part of my, my thesis work. So all of the dance artists and my husband, shown here, standing alongside me, um, and I made that regalia. Oh, he, you can't see it, but he designed up my uh, gown for my doctoral graduation, and he painted that hat to match the colors of my gown. So Wakawiti, William Wasden, he composed a chief's headdress dance, which is one of our most prestigious dances. And my husband carved an amholite, which is in Gabriel George, Chief Dan George's son's hand there. So we gave everyone that song and everyone the headdress to dance that dance. And then um, for that work, plus being such a central figure and in, in, um, an inspiration in my research, all of the regalia that Wahuidi is wearing was made by my husband for him. So he potlatched my PhD. And uh, this was our son, Nick, uh, standing by that huge copper shield that my husband gifted me for finally finishing my PhD. Um, he, uh, this was the first time he hosted a potlatch. From my witnessing research methodology, so methodologies first, rather than coming to a study thinking, that I know exactly what I'm going to focus on. So I came with it through the methodologies of methodology of witnessing and emerging from the time spent with these incredible dance artists, their dance groups, and attending all, as, many, as many performances I, as I possibly could. Protocol emerged as a central focus in my work on First Nations dance. My research specifically focus, examines the way in which protocol, bodies of laws that, are, that form indigenous legal systems, is asserted, negotiated, and enacted by First Nations dance artists. The relationship between protocol and Northwest Coast First Nations dance is immensely complex. So I use, we tend to use it in the singular, but it doesn't mean that it's just one, and it doesn't mean that it's static. It's fluid, and there are many protocols, as there are many ways, many teachings that come together in the insertion of this, of indigenous government governance. And that, Some of the ways that protocol along the Northwest Coast governs indigenous dance practices is uh, really about who has inherited rights to perform songs and dances, how their songs and dances are performed, um, what regalia is used, and uh, collected the way in which it expresses collective identity but also defines ownership and asserts ownership to territories and waterways. So my research specifically examines the ways in which protocol is central to the process of creating new songs and dances and uh, in collaboration, as well as the performances themselves. This allowed me to have uh, a deeper understanding of the factors that inform decision making and to investigate what was really at stake in our dance practices, what was really at stake in these performances. 
the fundamental connection uh, between protocol and Northwest Coast First Nations dance is that it's really a, the way in which these dances, uh, songs and dances are integral to individual and collective identity at, as well as relationship and ownership to land and waterways. So in, the, in their work, Northwest Coast First Nations artists assert, negotiate, and act protocol governing, governing the rights to songs and dances. It's absolutely entrenched in local politics. For our people, it's family, clan, community, and nation. But all of that is informed with how, by how their work engages with provincial, national, and international politics. My study revealed that Northwest Coast First Nations dance artists and their dance group deploy protocol in strategic and dynamic ways that are responsive to diverse performative, social, and political demands. The central argument of my work is that protocol constitutes much more than the boundaries of their artistic practices. It's a creative lens through which they enact dancing sovereignty. I founded the concept of dancing sovereignty as a theoretical framework from which to critically engage, to give, you, to give people that aren't a part of our dance practice that lens to see our dances for their complexity. That sovereignty is embodied in Northwest Coast First Nations dance practices through complex and responsive assertions of protocol. Through my research, I have examined the ways in which dance protocol is asserted, negotiated, and acted by First Nations dance artists through their selection of ancestral songs, their creation of new songs and dances, their collaborative processes with non-Indigenous dance artists or uh, dance artists of other First Nations, and throughout the performance itself. My use of sovereignty specifically refers to the maintenance and expansion of Indigenous laws and legal systems. So this has been is up there for a while. My definition of dancing sovereignty is self-determination carried out through the creation of performances that adhere to and expand upon protocol in ways that affirm hereditary rights and privileges amongst diverse audiences and collaborators. These assertions of sovereignty are not more to Western legal definitions. They are articulated through indigenous nationhood and the protocol and epistemologies thereof. The theoretical framework, as Gerald was talking about, for dancing sovereignty does honor visual sovereignty. It actually grew out of my work on indigenous photography, which is uh, visual sovereignty was born out of the discussions of photography created by indigenous artists. And as well as the concept of transmotion that's put forward by Gerald Visner and the Canadian philosopher and dance artist Aaron Manning's work on relationscapes. Recent works by Jolene Ricard, Seneca film scholar Michelle Rahasia, and seminal Muscovy and Diné artist and scholar uh, Halea Sinajeni and visual anthropologist Kristen Dowell are essential to my understanding and use of visual sovereignty. So if you're not familiar with visual sovereignty, it functions as both a term that describes the way in which indigenous visual artists, photographers, and filmmakers assert sovereignty through their work and how these assertions are integral to their artistic process. Dancing sovereignty carries forward these Attributes will remaining focused on the way in which protocol is foundational to artistic processes of song composition, choreography, collaboration, and other aspects of performances. Now, Visner's use of the term transmotion uh, is to refer to practices of sovereignty rooted in physical and metaphorical movements through time and ancestral territory. For him, transmotion is conveyed through the motions and meanings of oral history, subsistence methods, and visual art. So my approach extends his con uh, conceptualization to include dance in order to investigate 
practices of sovereignty specific to Northwest Coast First Nations dance artists, their epistemologies, and territories. I use the term transmotion to refer to what I've, what you've probably noticed me saying a, a few times over, to talk about that movement that is assertion, negotiation, and an action of protocol as a part of the creative process and performance. So through continuous transmotion of protocol, Northwest Coast First Nations artists forge new relationships while reinforcing existing ones. This relationality is made manifest through embodied practices, oratory, songs, and dances that can be seen as producing what Aaron Manning calls relationscapes. Relationscapes are relational nexuses between land and people. Manning discusses relationscapes as being generated through the ability to respond, which he refers to as response ability. So really looking at the capacity that, that artists have to respond to land and to people. So I draw upon Manning's concept of relationscapes to examine the relationship that is formed and performed through the transmotion of protocol integral to practices of dancing sovereignty. And now on to the case study, finally. So here we go. Now you guys can come along with me. Uh, so I'll conclude my talk today with a case study that focuses on Kukwakiwa dance artist Wahawiti, shown here at the drum, the log drum, and his composition uh, of and choreograph choreography for the Grease Trail song. And I'm going to play about 20 seconds of it so you can just hear it. This well-known and much-loved invitational dance of the Numgis tribe of the Kukwakiwa and the Moachat tribe of the Nuchanuth, whose territories are located on Vancouver Island, uh, will be the focus of my analysis, specifically the transmission of protocol integral to Wakawati's process of song composition and choreography and the ways in which it affirms Numgis and Moachat land rights as well as his, as his own hereditary privileges through his responsibility that generates a multi-nation relationscape. Having trained with his elders since the age of 19, Wahoidi Chief William Wasden is able to sing hundreds of ancestral songs and recall the ownership of each and their histories. One of the most renowned composers of his nation, he has created 500 songs, over 500 songs. In 1999, Wakawiti composed the Grease Trail song to commemorate a historic journey that he and three of his cousins experienced while reclaiming an ancient trade route. So this is the beginning of the trail shown here. 
and that trade route went across Vancouver Island right there. That's in this process, so referred to as a grease trail, it extends from Namgi's territory on the east coast of Vancouver Island to Moachat territory on the west coast. These ancient trade routes are called grease trails because Ulican grease, a delicacy that's made of fermented fish oil, which for our people still today, this is, it is a, a commodity, it's delicious. We, we put fish oil on everything, that's why our skin looks so good. And uh, that these trade routes during the winter time when we didn't have fresh fish, it was Olican grease that kept us alive until the Olicans actually ran in February. So it was a way that we kept our bodies healthy with our omega three sixes and nines and have this incredible um, brains that can call upon ancient histories through our oral uh, practices. So grease trails, as they're referred to, is uh, their precious places for us that in the ways that they not only acted as places of commerce, but exchange of ideas. And these vast trade networks went as from our coast um, to east over the Rockies. As colonial policies in British Columbia historically and presently oppressed indigenous lands and waterway practices, Wakawiti and those who traveled with them were the first in over 100 years to use this grease trail. Prior to beginning their journey, Wahawiri sought and received permission from hereditary chiefs on both the Numgis and Moachat sides of the territories. Um, he stated, quote, this protocol is carried forward from ancient times as the land was deemed private property belonging to chiefs, unquote. His transmotion of protocol and responsibility of Numgis and Moachat chiefs who granted their permission was the beginning of the relationscape that was embodied in the, pra the practice of walking the Grease Trail and further expanded upon through the song and dance. I'll show you this clip again. So usually I can control the volume, so I'm gonna show this clip twice. I don't know if anybody is up there. So one time I'm going to talk over the song. Hopefully the microphone will carry. But the first time, I'm just going to show it to you. go back and hopefully we can if not I will try to be really loud so here we go the dance for the grease trail song was composed by Wahawiti and Kyoti Nelson of the Numgis men who carried this journey the dancers marched forward with their knees raised high and their arms swinging to the beat their actions mimicking the movement of the men as they tromped through the grease trails overgrown path by stepping over and through thick brush on an even terrain. Each time the course starts, the dancer on the outside of the circle crosses in front of the one on the inside. The action of crisscrossing refers to the ways in which Wahoi, Kyori, and other Namgis men helped each other along the grease trail, trail by taking turns leading. The pairs switch sides. They duck as they did through the grease trail to go underneath overgrown branches. At the end of the song, the dancers lock arms, symbolizing the nation-to-nation -nation relationship, their nation-to-nation -nation relationscape between the Numgis Mo and Moachat people and their territorial connections through this shared grease trail. The lyrics of this song, like many ancient and new songs, 
and dances on the Northwest Coast, the Grease Trail serves as a multifaceted embodied archive, layered in meanings relating to Kwakwakwa epistemology, the lyrics of the Grease Trail song poetically reference the experience of the four men along the trail and the land rights of their people and hereditary privileges, as well as the reclamation of not only the trail, but of the spiritual powers of their ancestors. The reoccurring Kwakwala verse, which translates to, what shall we do, my brothers, refers to the planning involved before, during, and after their journey along the Grease Trail most of which has overgrown as is embodied in the movements of the dance. The reason that they could follow the trail was that elk herds continued to use the path in their migration from the east coast of Vancouver Island to the west coast. Wakawiti, Kyote, and other, others used this elk path to guide them. Wakawiti felt that the elk's continued use of the trail connected their journey with the trail's origins in Numgis oral history. In their oral history, it said that a medicine person found the trail by following the elk over to Moachat territory, where he encountered people speaking a different language. This is referenced in the third verse of the song, which translates to, come along, let's go to the other side of the world, the west coast. Wakawini states, quote, for us, because their territory is where our borderline stopped, that was the end of the world for us." Unquote. This verse, along with the transmotion of protocol asking chiefs of each nation for permission to pass through their territory as reinforces the Numgis and Moachat land rights that are inherited in the song and dance. Community members estimated that the Grease Trail was 14 miles long and it would take at least four days for them to make it through the mountains. To everyone's surprise, they arrived at the end uh, and in Moachat territory one day later. Their, relative, their relatives, as relatives do, teased them and said that the short travel time uh, with that short travel time, they teased them about using a hot air balloon to make it over. So Wahawiti's response was to write into the song, the into Kwakwala, which translate, translates, come, let's fly around the world like our ancestors once did with their supernatural and spiritual powers. He states, my ancestors have the power of the quartz crystal, where we have certain dances that refer to a young boy possessed by a spirit of a bird called Madam. The bird gave him the quartz crystal and he had the power to fly. So this verse is saying, come fly with me to the other side of the world. The humor of it being that our relatives said, did you have a hot air balloon to get over there? Did you fly over there? Because it was so fast, but for us, it was that we have the spiritual powers of our ancestors if we dig down deep enough into our traditions and teachings. The reference in this verse, the reclamation of spiritual power of flight in combination with the teasing about the speed of their journey demonstrates how Wahawiti's practice of dancing sovereignty draws upon his inherited repertoire of songs and dances to ancestralize the present. Together with his elders, Wahawiti decided that this Grease Trail song was going to be an amlala, or social dance. Amlalas are typically shared at the end of potlatches or dance group performances to invite all of the witnesses to join the host family or dance group on the floor. The Grease Trail song is known as the Moachat Amlala because of Wahawiti's uh, Wakawili first gifted it to the Moachat Nation in relation, in recognition of their ancient and ongoing nation-nation, nation-to-nation relationship. The gifting, and I hope the volume is back up in there, the gifting of uh, rights to perform the Grease Trail song is central to Wakawili's practice of dancing sovereignty. As a result, many First Nations communities and dance groups along the Northwest Coast perform the Grease Trail song at both public and private ceremonies all throughout the year. As it is protocol to state the ownership and history of the song prior to its performance, 
the land rights of the Numkees and Moachat people are reinforced by many other nations through the retelling and embodiment of its history. This is just one example. This footage was taken at the Paddles to, to Sonomish, a tribal canoe journey that, takes, that took place in July of 2011 in LeConnor, Washington. Tribal canoe journey it happens every year, and this song is danced by multiple nations. And through these actions, Northwest Coast First Nations people from many nations become a part of the relationscape generated by Wahoiti's practice of dancing sovereignty. This is one of the innumerable examples that demonstrate how the work of dance groups can be viewed from many perspectives as a rich art historical record that reflects change, continuities, and priorities of Northwest Coast First Nations people today. As I've demonstrated through my analysis of this case study and the many that inform my work, for Northwest Coast First Nations dance artists, protocol is more than just the boundaries of our practices. It's the artistic lens through which we create new songs and dances that assert and affirm our people's lands, land rights, epistemology, hereditary privileges. This is indigenous practices of sovereignty, which I refer to as dancing sovereignty. Bringing this work into the field of art history, I was met with tremendous institutional and departmental resistance to the point to which I almost didn't finish my PhD. But this year, <laughs> uh, this case study uh, was published as the second chapter in a seminal volume on indigenous art histories in the US and Canada. I include this as my final slide um, for those that might be, not only for those that might be interested in reading it, but more to let the students and the artists and the activists know that these battles are well worth it. Thank you.